Aloha. My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm the executive director of the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. And um, I welcome you to this uh, uh, session, which should be extremely interesting. Uh, it's on a, on a topic of great interest to Hawaiians and to uh, anyone who's interested in Hawaiian history. And uh, you have an expert moderator and an expert author. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Lawrence Conshaw and uh, enjoy. Okay, uh, aloha mai kako, uh, velina mai. Um, welcome to this uh, wonderful uh, session, hopefully for, for everybody. Um, so um, we have a, a very distinguished speaker today. Um, let me uh, just introduce her briefly. Um, her name is Susan Crawley. She was born and raised in Ko'olaupoko on Oahu and holds a PhD in history from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She has researched um, extensively in Hawaiian and English language newspapers, letters, manuscripts, and manuscript collections, and uh, Hawaiian kingdom governments, government documents uh, of the period uh, approximately 1820 to 1860. Uh, Susan's research uh, conclusions about Kawikia Uli's struggle for sovereign control, further the historical dialogue that non-European rulers deliberately molded their state's responses to governance changes in ways that suited their own cultural and political needs. So um, I guess without further ado, uh, let me turn over to Susan so she can um, talk a little bit about uh, her book. So please, Susan, just give a short introduction and summary of what your book is about. Thank you, Dr. Gonshar. I'm very pleased to be here today to talk about my book with everyone. You know, I find that too often when scholars write about the monarchical period in Hawaiian history, they see events through their own lens of modern day biases and judgments. Hindsight can be a critical judge. It wants different outcomes more preferable to those of us living in the future. But if we want to understand Kamehameha III's decisions, then we need to see them from his point of view. What circumstances was he faced with and how did he respond? This is critical because several of his decisions are controversial in our own times. The Mahele, for example, and the hiring of white ministers. Kaui Keoli enjoyed the longest, most significant reign in Hawaiian monarchical history. But there isn't much written about his central role in events. Sure, I know there are several comprehensive histories of 19th century Hawaii that cover him during those events. And there's even a social history of the king. But he's frequently portrayed by scholars as being only mildly interested in state affairs and as having an imperfect understanding of the governance changes enacted during his reign. Many scholars insist that it was his white ministers who ran the government. But as I read through archival documents, I asked myself, what did the king say about the circumstances he was faced with? And then what did he do? And the answers gave me a different picture of the king. I learned that he was actually deeply involved in managing state affairs and that he was very determined to take whatever actions he needed to take to keep the kingdom free and independent during what turned out to be very perilous times. In his own words, he was guided by figuring out ke ano ho e pono, new ways of doing things. And that one phrase, tells us a lot about his leadership style. New ways were very much needed because, and, and now this is, a, this is a quotation from an 1845 document, because there was no practical way to keep foreigners from coming ashore. Instead, the king needed to figure out how to manage that influx of traders and merchants while at the same time safeguarding his independence and the rights of his Hawaiian subjects. 
but gunboat assaults by British and French captains in 1836 and 1839 challenged the king's authority to determine some of the legal rights of the foreigners living in his kingdom. In fact, in 1839, he was forced into a treaty that limited his control over what judicial and economic policies applied to French foreigners. In response, the king demanded to know, does this nation have standing among the kingdoms of the earth? What an important question. It shows that the king understood why the kingdom was vulnerable. It also tells us that he knew what the remedy was. He needed to ensure that the maritime powers acknowledged that he ruled over an independent sovereign state. And so he set about making sure that he had that acknowledgement. Even after France and Britain recognized the territorial sovereignty, however, they continued to limit his authority over their subjects by what are called extraterritorial terms in treaties that they forced on him. Now, what sets my analysis apart from other studies of his reign is the fact that the evidence I used for his decisions is the king's own speech recorded in his own language in his own administrative records. This evidence shows that it was the king himself who was the leader in setting policy, always keeping in mind that he needed to find a way to remove those extraterritorial restrictions. His reign is well documented. Contemporary accounts tell us all about events. Privy Council books record his personal orders about the challenges those events posed. Those orders are important in and of themselves, but when I looked at them in relationship to each other, I saw that what they were actually were tactical policies. And taken as a whole, those tactics formed a multi-stage effort that unfolded over a series of years designed to regain his control over all governance functions. And that is what my book is about. I start at the beginning of his reign with his first command, his vision for the future, that his rule would be characterized by literacy. O ko'u aupuni, aupalapala ko'u. Soon literacy was embedded in the entire social fabric. Then in early chapters, I describe how the 1840 constitution signaled to an international audience that he was the sovereign head of an independent state. I also review governing bodies and profile key officials. A thriving cosmopolitan business community developed with commercial and infrastructure demands, while urban growth, disease, and demographic change contributed to social unrest. In succeeding chapters, I focus on specific political tactics of the King's strategy. I analyze how each tactic was implemented, what the king's rationale for it was, any problems encountered during implementation, and then I evaluate each tactic's effectiveness. One chapter is about the king's decision to place whites in key ministerial positions because he needed Western political skills so that he could manage international relationships. That decision caused a lot of controversy. Several thousand Hawaiians launched the 1845 petitioning campaign to get it reversed. Even foreigners objected to the policy, but the king persisted. Another chapter is about the impact that British Captain Paulette's 1843 takeover had because it caused the king to re-exam legal and landholding policies. After a multi-year process, legislation strengthened the judicial system to the satisfaction of foreigners and land tenure changers secured fee simple title for all Hawaiians. There's a chapter that analyzes the King's communication strategy, 
He bought his own English language newspaper so that he could send word of his policies to Europe and America in order to develop favorable global opinion. When he learned that consuls at Honolulu were saying one thing in their letters to him and another thing in their letters to their home offices, he began a policy of printing both sides of diplomatic disputes in the pages of his newspaper. Favorable reports back from foreign press confirmed the success of this print media policy. Then the last tactic I investigate is the King's approach to treaty renegotiations. At first, he used a conventional approach, announced a desire to renegotiate and come to better terms. But after yet another gunboat assault in 1849, he changed his tactic to insist that French and British treaty partners adopt the treaty format that he had just negotiated with the US. And if either nation refused to remove the onerous treaty restrictions, then he would use the only leverage he possessed. He threatened to transfer the kingdom's sovereignty to one of their rival trading partners. It was his best card. It was the ultimate threat. And it worked. Britain complied and France wasn't far behind. Now, I've been asked why I conclude that this was a purposeful strategy. Well, it was a series of actions designed to achieve a particular goal. It's the sequence of events the direct orders and the gradual accumulation of political changes that built a platform on which the king could base his demands for fair and equitable treaties. And it had to be a global strategy. The king's enemies were not domestic, they were international, driven by the global forces of capitalism and imperialism and backed by those very profitable trading structures. And so he hired his own officials who could deliver his own diplomatic message to an international audience. He removed the source of gunboat challenges by making institutional changes. At the same time, his own newspaper carried articles about his governance to mold foreign opinion abroad. And just to make sure that he was successful, he threatened that he would upend those powerful trading groups by giving away the kingdom of one of their rivals should they refuse to change their treaties. I found it to be a masterful strategy and it worked. Now, while Kaoikeoli had inherited a traditionally governed kingdom whose territorial protection had been guaranteed only by Britain, he delivered to Kamehameha IV an independent, remodeled nation able to meet contemporary challenges with a global leadership platform whose future territorial and functional sovereignty was guaranteed by all three maritime powers. There was a remarkable accomplishment by a very remarkable king. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan, for that summary. Um, that's, I mean, it sounds all very exciting. I mean, if I if, if I hadn't read most of the book already, I would definitely right now probably fill out the form and order it to get it. Um, and I hope that some of our viewers have, or most of our viewers hopefully will have the same feeling. Um, now, um, I have just a, a few questions. I mean, you, you were already kind of, I think, pretty, uh, you've just explained uh, most of the content uh, and the logic of that book, I think, really well. Now, um, just one thing I, I was wondering, um, if you could talk a little, bit, a little bit more about your personal motivation, um, what brought you um, to do like what, I mean, first of all, what, what brought you to Hawaii in 19th century Hawaiian history and specifically what brought you to Kawakia Uli? Just, you know, that's something that maybe some of our readers are, are curious about. So could you please talk a little bit about that? Yes, sure. Well, I'd already uh, written several articles about uh, uh, Kamehameha II, Liho Liho, and his trip to England and, and had published them. And, and so I was already uh, interested in, if you will, that 
uh, first half of uh, the 19th century. And I was in the doctoral program casting about for, uh, for a thesis and I was uh, researching in the Hawaii State Archives. I go down there, I didn't have any clear idea of what I wanted to do. So I went down and I just started reading the different administrative series of the whole monarchical period, just starting at the beginning and then going all the way up. I like uh, interior department starts in about 1820 and then all the way up through 1880. Uh, and uh, at, at the same time, I, I was uh, reading traditional histories, you know, Kuykendall, Ralph Kuykendall, uh, uh, Bradley, and uh, I began to be struck with the disconnect of how events in the 1840s were portrayed. Um, you know, if you read Kuykendall, uh, uh, Wiley did everything. But when you read the Privy Council records, you see that Kamehameha the third himself was definitely in charge. And so that disconnect that uh, uh, who was actually running the government, what, uh, who was doing what. And I, I, I found particular sentences out of the Privy Council records that, that formed these tactics and went from there. Okay, thank you. Um, that um, that sounds, you know, like kind of, I guess, similar to some of my, my own experiences uh, that I had in, in researching. Um, for those of you who don't know me, for I, my own research was not focused on one person, but it was about the agency of the Hawaiian kingdom and its leadership in a more general sense, and especially in promoting kind of a pan-Oceanian, pan-like pan-Pacific or, you know, Pacific regionalist uh, uh, policies uh, during the 19th century. So, but I have come across kind of very similar uh, processes in, in kind of thought processes of, of having been confronted with a certain a certain style of history writing that completely minimizes this, this agency as opposed to uh, what I found in, in some of the archival and primary documents. So I can, I can totally relate to that. Now, um, I just, Still wanted to kind of have a follow uh, to follow up on that though is in the sense of are there any um, is there any previous like recent scholarship that has influenced you any other scholars maybe even some of those that are here during the book and music festival this year I'm just curious if like if you how you position yourself in like kind of current scholarship of Hawaii and, and any any precedent you know the uh, uh, the book that uh, uh, that I referred to the most. Uh, uh, Bonaventura Mar. Have you ever read her, her work? And yes, I did. I'm very familiar with her. With her. Yes. 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 And, and you know, she she did a, a masterful uh, uh, analysis of uh, different uh, Pacific areas and and how they changed their governance in order to um, uh, meet the um, uh, meet the challenges that were being brought in by Westerners and and. I, I was quite struck with uh, what it is she had to say. Thank you. That's uh, I, I would agree. Like she's like really this. Um, I'm, I'm so I never met her personally, but I'm I'm so regretful that she that she passed away so so prematurely. Yes, she would, she would yes. have become one of the great one of the great like modern one of the great great kind of you know emerging Pacific scholars of this century for for sure. Um, now um, that's that's uh, a kind of a big international scholar that's very that not very well known in Hawaii. So I'm I'm glad you're bringing her up. I think that's that's a book that is by the way it's called Decolonize, Decolonization and the Pacific. Um, yes. Uh, what does she call them? It's a very well, interesting. Yeah. I think there's another second title. Uh, it's subtitle. a very interesting. My brain is failing me, so um, I have to. But it's, it up. Uh, yeah, what so, does she uh, call them? Uh, imperial uh, literacy. Yes, exactly. So um, that is certainly, yeah, that's certainly, so thank you for bringing that up. Now, are there any Hawaii-based scholars that you also cite or that you kind of see yourself in kind of operating in the wake of them? Um, well, uh, uh, Lilikala Kamehameha had some very interesting comments to make about uh, uh, the sovereignty model, the governing model, 
uh, that was in effect immediately before the Constitution. She described uh, uh, Humano's uh, uh, religious political model and uh, contrasted that with uh, Koi Keoli's uh, traditional Lono practices model and, and um, um, posited that, uh, uh, that, well, of course, Kaumanu uh, uh, passed away. And then uh, uh, Kamehameha III found that his own model wasn't working. There were too many things were happening, including these uh, gunboat assaults. And uh, she says that, uh, that, that it was the failure of, uh, that, that he believed it was a failure of that model that moved him uh, to uh, the constitutional framework. Okay. So that was, that was very inter mm -hmm. instrumental in helping me to think that part through. Yeah, no, definitely. I think I think there are a lot of there's a lot of of of, of uh, Lily Clark. I mean, he was research that is certainly uh, uh, influential and, and and can be used by by various uh, although, other. Although yes. per personally, as I worked my way through it, if I could just add this, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, the model was uh, that uh, a Hawaiian sovereign rules through mana and pono, power and authority and fitness to rule. And, and uh, what I saw happening was uh, Hawaiians never challenged his authority, but they did challenge his fitness to rule. As a young man, he was uh, um, uh, feeling his oats, if you will. Uh, and now come the gunboat assaults, 1836. Now those guys, they didn't, uh, they didn't challenge his fitness to rule and they didn't challenge his authority over his own people. What they challenged was his authority over their people. And uh, so, uh, that, you know, I, I see it as a watershed event for him, mm -hmm. recognizing that he needed to find a way to make a public expression about his constant, you know, his authority. What, what was the, uh, where was his uh, authority uh, located? What could he point to? Uh, that makes a, uh, so it, it, the constitution became a public expression of sovereign control to use on an international level. Yeah, absolutely. That, that um, I would totally agree with you on that. Um, I'm just wondering, um, because I, you know, one person that comes to my mind who has recently or relatively recently, almost 10 years ago now, but uh, a recent, but relatively recently written about it is Kamana Beamer, um, with his book, No, uh, no, uh, no, no Mako Kamana, which is, I think, one of the, in, in my opinion, is, 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 is a really great kind of reassessment of the Hawaiian kingdom and the way that, that native leadership uh, asserted authority and, and agency in there. Uh, any comments on, on that or how may that may have influenced uh, your own work? Yes, certainly. I, I uh, did a lot of uh, uh, reading in, in his work. And yes, I agree. Uh, uh, he, he had some very interesting insights to uh, why they chose uh, particular ways. Uh, I didn't think he, you know, he didn't elaborate on uh, Kamehameha III uh, uh, in any great detail, I didn't think, at least it, it wasn't to me. Sure. But I must say, well, I wanted uh, who, who influenced me, uh, uh, Keanu Sai and, and you, Dr. Gonshore, in terms of uh, the constitutional framework mm -hmm. and uh, also in terms of uh, uh, the position of Kukina Nui. I, I got a lot of insight from uh, the work of both of the, your, you know, both of you. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, for pointing that out. Um, I, I I appreciate that acknowledgement. Uh, on the other hand, I must say that, especially in that analysis that I've given on the kind of kingdom institutions and how they changed early on, I also personally must say that I owe a lot to. Uh, especially Kamana Beamer's research, which I also cite in my book a lot in that in that chapter. So I wouldn't say that uh, this is uh, that that is entirely my own working. So I mean, if it wasn't for especially Kamana and also Keanu, uh, uh, I would not have uh, uh, written that. So like you know, give credit where credit is due. You know, so just wanted to wanted to 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 say right. that uh, so that not to put me too too much on a, on a pedestal in, in in that here. But yeah, thank you for that. Um, Another question that has come up is, is I, I'm just wondering, um, 
you know, calling here Uli's period is uh, is the one probably period that has been at least in, in kind of traditional historiography has been associated most with uh, with the missionaries, with the presence of the American missionaries, and with you know some previous historians have even called this not just in Hawaii but in other parts of the Pacific too have called these a missionary kingdom or like missionary kingdoms. You know these kind of Hawaii, early Polynesian like transformed Polynesian states in in, in the nineteenth century. Um, so. I was wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit more on how you see the relationship between Kawikia Uli and the missionaries. Well, uh, certainly he he picked up uh, a lot of ideas, had a lot of conversations, not only with missionaries, but also with visiting uh, uh, captains from uh, different countries and uh, talked a lot with people and, and gathered a lot of information. Uh, but but the uh, the point I wanted to make and uh, the point that I picked up from my research was that it was, uh, you, know, you know, just because he got new ideas and new ways of doing things uh, didn't mean that he had uh, given control over to another group. He was in charge. He and the chiefs made the decisions on what they wanted to do next. They were the ones who acted with agency. And that, to me, that turns missionaries and, and other sea captains and other people that he uh, that, that he counseled with into supporting roles. Sure, sure. Uh, they gave him ideas that uh, from their Western orientation on what would work, but he and the chiefs met together and made their own decisions. And so frequently in the Privy Council records, you can see when something happens and they've got to make a decision, the king and the chiefs go off together and converse with each other in Hawaiian. And then they come back and announce their decision. That so, makes I, a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've, I've come to similar conclusions by those materials that I read from that, from that period. Now, talking about the language, though, that's something that I find is really fascinating in your research because, um, you know, you are one of the few um, scholars that has used like uh, uh, a lot of uh, Hawaiian sources, but actually not even focused that much on them, but focused more on actually the, 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 the role of the English press and the way it was strategically used by Kawikiuli, that I found very, very particularly interesting because, you know, we have, there's a lot of this dichotomy often going on that, oh, you have to, you know, like Kaikinon or whatever, they use English sources and they got an incomplete picture, which I agree. And then, but then there's a sense, oh, we need to read all the Hawaiian so we understand that. And but then kind of sometimes if it gets exaggerated, you leave the English aside. So, you know, uh, instead of kind of polarizing between the two languages, uh, I think what I really love is that you kind of acknowledge the importance of both of those languages, which I do as well in, in my work. And so um, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because that I found really fascinating how like the English language press that has often been portrayed as being just kind of representing whatever colonial Western interests or whatever. And then how, what, what kind of role the English language press played in that strategy of, of Kawikia Uli? Well, uh, you know, it just, it just hit me. Uh, when you read, um, uh, so it became the government press in 1844 and Jarvis was the editor. Mm -hmm. And in the first issue as the government press, he said that it was specifically, uh, um, going to send the king's policies and procedures to Europe and America so that they could judge for themselves of his ability to run the nation. And, and you know, and, and so it was just clicked in my head. I mean, sure, it's an English language newspaper and people in Hawaii who speak English and only English are gonna read it, but, but you can't look at it in that narrow little sense. It's uh, it, it's much bigger than that, and and uh, 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 author named uh, Hogburn, uh, oh, help me out here. I can't I can't think of his uh, uh, his book title, but it was on um, uh, press and media and and uh, uh, how it carries it's it's you know it carries into other cultures and states what it is you're saying. And, and that's what he did. Yeah. I mean, he spoke to the world through that newspaper. And they were very careful what they put in. You read the Privy Council uh, records. Uh, uh, they would get together um, 
Uh, Wiley would have drafts of letters. They would examine the letters. They would decide which ones they liked, which ones they didn't. And then they would print those mm -hmm. in the newspaper. And it was intended, fully intended from the very beginning as a government press to be uh, a bully pulpit. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. And so just to see it uh, only in, in relationship to uh, people reading it in Hawaii, it was just uh, too narrow a focus. Did that answer your question? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 I totally agree. I mean, that to me is like in my own analysis, is kind of very similar because I, I think what really the challenge for modern uh, uh, historiography of Hawaii is, is that kind of, I think what you are really doing is that we need to reevaluate, we need to go into the entire corpus that was produced at that time. And first of all, of course, um, uh, you know, take out the Hawaiian out of the archives, out of the dust, out of the dust of the archives and make it make it live again. But of course, also look, also re-examine yeah. the way that English language choices have been interpreted by, you know, by right. people like Heikendall or whatever, where they were just interpreted right. in a totally different direction of what they actually should, what they actually were as primary sources at that time. So I totally agree, but th thank you for, right. for, for uh, elaborating that on that again. Right. Um, that is, I, I, I absolutely. Uh, Miles, you. Miles Ogburn. Indian Inc. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Indian Inc. Miles uh, Ogburn. Uh, well, uh, on the on the Hawaiian language one, of course. Uh, uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna present what the community thought, what the community knew, uh, it, what as uh, events were happening, then you have to give. Uh, articles from both languages. You have to look in both places. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And and I think what I'm what I'm really glad is that slowly, I think with like some of the research that has been recently, uh, that has I guess has started, you know, to scratch the surface. I think there's like a lot more to come in the in the future. Is that we really need to assess the Hawaiian Kingdom just like any other modern country has been assessed by historians, which is that it has both a, 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 a domestic scene and an international presence, and they both kind of interact all the time. And of course, for all countries that don't necessarily, that don't speak a, let's say, global language as their own main language, I guess, if, if your country is English, French, or Spanish speaking, then I guess you can pretty much mix, pretty much amalgamate the two, but right. any country whose national language is not one of these three or four, you obviously have like an interaction between two languages. Like if you look at the, the, right. the policy of, I mean, just like take, I mean, just well, take like a modern example, like look at Ukraine. I mean, there's like, it's in the, the news all over. Of course, of course you can only understand what's going on if you if you know what the Ukrainian, what, what happens in, lang in Ukrainian domestically, right. but also what is being produced right. by Ukrainian leaders in English at the UN and whatever, you know? So, I mean, that is obviously you know, a, a, a perfect example of that. And I think the same view has to be seen for like the whole Kingdom, you know, like it's a Hawaiian speaking community, but it interacts through an international language, which is English at that time, mainly somewhat French to some extent as well, but mainly English with the rest of the world. So absolutely. I, I, right, I right. You know, uh, students of Hawaiian history are so fortunate to have such a, a wonderful, uh, uh, rich archive source. And, and uh, so many of the Hawaiian language uh, newspapers online, so mm -hmm. that they can do this research. They can they can uh, find out what you know uh, what the whole community was talking about and thinking about. And uh, you know many of the archival sources uh, were uh, were uh, written in both languages at the time that they were recorded, which is of course a help too. Sure. Um, okay, well, let's let me just like because I'm the moderator, I just want to kind of keep track of the structure a little bit here. So there are some questions are pouring in from the audience. I see some here. Uh, for those of you who have asked them, don't worry, we will cover them. I just wanted to just make a little kind of interruption here because we wanted to get to, I guess, before we go to the audience questions, um, I will uh, give you a chance for like, I guess, the highlight of this session, namely that you, I would ask you if you, if you, if you're kind enough to just uh, read a segment of your choice from the book. Uh, I understand that you have pre prepared already uh, a segment of that. So just, I guess, to give our potential readers some kind of feel of how, what your book, how it actually, 
listens like and feels like to to uh, to to read it. So I'm just I, I would appreciate if you could do that now. Thanks. I, yes, I'm going to read uh, an excerpt uh, from one of those uh, controversial uh, policies that he had, and that was his rationale for hiring Western educated whites in key roles. Well, it quickly became apparent during the disputes with Richard Charlton and U.S. Commissioner Brown that the Hawaiian government needed persons representing its interests who understood the interaction of kingdom law with treaty and international law and could make a strong legal defense for the kingdom's rights and privileges. Hiring Western educated white ministers became a key tactic to fill those roles. Kauike Oli formally opened the 1845 legislative session on May 20th. In his speech, he noted the appointments of Jared Judd as interior minister, Robert Wiley as foreign minister, and John Rickard as attorney general. News of the king's appointment spread widely. A broad segment of the community attended the opening ceremonies and heard the king's speech. The Polynesian printed the text in English in its May 24th edition, and Ka'eleele carried the speech in Hawaiian in its May 29th issue. But what happened next came as a surprise to the king, the Privy Council, and members of the legislature. Word arrived in Honolulu on June 10th or 11th that many Hawaiians on Maui were in a state of excitement and that they intended to petition the king to dismiss the white officers. Indeed, petitions signed by hundreds of Hawaiians began to arrive at Honolulu in mid-June from Kailua, Hawaii Island, from Lahaina and Wailuku, Maui, and from Lanai. The prayer read, Ho'oli ina luna haoli, i koho ia i luna no ke aupuni Hawaii. Refuse the foreigners appointed as ministers for the Hawaiian government. Reports arrived at Honolulu that people at Lahaina had held political meetings and prayed that the nation may be delivered from the influence of foreigners. The legislature appointed John E.E. E. and Keone Ana to draft a response to explain what the governance need was for white ministers. It read in part, if these shall be dismissed, where is there a man who is qualified to transact business with foreigners? Agitation against whites in government persisted, however. Hostility against the policy among resident foreigners also festered. Kaui Keoli toured Maui the following year, accompanied by Kuhina Nui Keoliana and several Privy Council members. Crowds of several thousand Hawaiians at Wailuku, Mokulau, and Hana gathered to hear him speak. The king put the matter quite frankly. Your hereditary chiefs have been in trouble trying to manage treaty negotiations and judge Westerners' grievances. And therefore, we have chosen ministers of white skin to aid them. This is according to the old system. They know more than we, and I have chosen them for the sake of their knowledge. The king warned of the danger that would result should the petitioners insist that the white ministers be dismissed. We have heard of your petitions. Should we consent to them, trouble would immediately follow, instantly, before night. I ask of you, therefore, to put an end to your wish to promote that petition. When challenged by British Admiral Seymour about the hiring of white ministers, the king succinctly described what had caused him to implement the policy. Were it not for the foreigners living under his jurisdiction, he would require no foreign officers. But foreigners with great cunning and perseverance have sought to involve him in difficulty, and that by experience, he found that he could not get along, but by appointing foreigners to cope with them. And that was the king's rationale 
based on the circumstances with which he was faced. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. It was, I think, actually one of the key um, uh, important points here too that, that probably uh, some some other questions would have come up about is like about that petition, right? I mean, that is that, and I think that chat, that segment answers it really well. That there has been a lot of this debate about you know Kawaki Uli going against his people that because there were so many people sending those petitions, right? But I mean, a lot of the I guess a lot of the scholarship on that often ignores that actually Kawaki Uli took the pain, took that very seriously, and actually took the pains to answer this petition. That I think you have really uh, uh, elaborated that really well and and very succinctly expressed that in this in this uh, uh, section that you that you read. Yes. Uh, you, want, you want to elaborate any more on that or? Uh, it, 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 uh, you, you know, uh, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, a lot of scholarship uh, notices the petitions, talks about them, quotes them, and then leaves the subject. Actually, uh, uh, there's a great deal that went on after the fact. Uh, a lot that the king, uh, the king investigated, a lot of... Uh, um, actions that he took, uh, uh, he was convinced that the white men, some white men had uh, instigated it and, and he even named a couple. Um, and uh, of course, Mala was involved, but then uh, so was Baldwin. And, and so there, there's no real way to know. Uh, but, but, but to me, that isn't the point of who did it. What, it was his reaction and, and his ability to express what the need was and why he did it and why he was going to continue with it. And I love that. Uh, there's nothing I could do but hire foreigners to cope with them. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, I mean, it, I, don't, I, I think it, it makes perfect sense. And if you look at other countries in the 19th century, you had very similar phenomenon. You had that in other Pacific countries. Uh, um, and often the often the the, the, the survival of, of, of you know especially small kind of tenuous kingdoms in the in the Pacific, their survival often depended really on the on the loyalty and quality of those foreigners that those those indigenous rulers had hired. And if they yes. hired the wrong ones, then you know then that kind of you know because it was like you know it's really important to have these kind of people who knew and when they were loyal they did great jobs. If they were not, then it was problematic, obviously. But you have that for larger countries too in the world, and I think you mentioned that too in your in your book somewhere, if I remember correctly. That even like large countries that were non-European, like like China, like Japan and Thailand, they hired at one point for and I know right. Ethiopia as well with uh, Emperor right. um, um, Mengitsu, I think at the time. So they hired foreigners too for that same purpose to have like you know for exactly. run their foreign policy and 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 for the diplomacy yes. and all these things. So yes. um, that's, uh, I think you- uh, It was a lot. typical, typical um, a tactic. Sure, sure. Um, let's just go through like some of the questions that I received here. So like, first of all, Argana, there's one that is, I guess, more like, a, I guess, a, a misinformation that, that is kind of with a question mark. So let, let me just, I guess, correct it, but you can add on anything if you want to. So uh, here is a question. Somebody was saying, uh, wasn't the Hawaiian language banned under the guidance of missionaries by Kaui Uli? And that is, in my understanding, just a, 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 a mis uh, that's just an error because the, the Hawaiian language wasn't banned until the under the post-American invasion, like the 1890-1896 Hawaiian so-called Republic, they banned the language. And if anything, in, from my own research, I know that the largest output of Hawaiian language production was long after Kawika Uli. So like there was like the peak of Hawaiian language materials being published, like thousands of pages every year was in the 1870s and 80s. Absolutely. So, um, uh, so there was, of course, there was absolutely not, no such thing as a Hawaiian language ban as long as Hawaii was an independent kingdom. Um, and, and the number have of, you or have you heard of any of any of that during Kauai Kauai's time? It wouldn't and the number of sense. Hawaiian the number of Hawaiian language newspapers mm -hmm. is phenomenal. Exactly, yeah. So Very right, popular. I mean, you you have not heard. I mean, that's com completely counter in, counter intuitive to anything that both of us have been researching on. Right, there was no such thing as a Hawaiian language ban during Kauai Kauai's time. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense to me. Uh, right, right. Right. Um, now, the second question I think that, that I have here is that um, somebody asks, um, can you elaborate on the Great Mahela? Uh, well, 
Uh, I think know, I think was yeah. one of the strategies too. So, uh, but, but you, I mean, for good reasons, you don't because you can't cover everything. You can't write a eight hundred page book, obviously. But uh, maybe uh, you can, like, just <laughs> elaborate a little bit on that, just to you know, the uh, the Mihaly is a very difficult subject to cover in in uh, two or three sentences or five minutes. Sure. Uh, sure. Many many scholars have written uh, some excellent uh, uh, treatises on them, and I consulted a lot of them. My point of view on the Mihaly and why it occurred was uh, strictly from the standpoint of the Tarleton case and what the outcome of that was. Kaukeoli himself, he had, uh, you know, he changed his mind considerably uh, as to how he thought land tenure should be. Um, Ten years earlier, he had been very much uh, uh, of the opinion that we should simply lease but never never sell so that you can take it back. And there were lots of laws in the uh, 1840s and uh, 1830s, early 1840s about how the land belonged to the chiefs and not the people. And the foreigners didn't own it any more than Hawaiians owned it. But then came the Charlton case. And Charlton uh, laid claim uh, to an important piece of property called uh, Pulahalaho in downtown Honolulu. And, uh, you know, it, it's part of why Paulette sailed off and, and took the place over. In any event, uh, Charlton's claim became uh, uh, embroiled in London politics and, and the London courts, and then was sent back to Honolulu for evidentiary hearings and ranking chiefs, ranking chiefs. And David Molo, too, testified that Charlton's deed that he claimed he had was not uh, it was it was invalid. It was a fraud. It wasn't a deed. Nevertheless, the British government ruled that uh, that it was valid, and uh, the king had to surrender the land to Charlton. Well, that was a real wake up call, because what he discovered from that was that uh, uh, Hawaii's traditional land tenure system uh, put everyone at risk to losing their land piece by piece, just because someone like Charlton would come in and claim that they owned it. And so that really was, uh, uh, in my opinion, that was, that was the watershed event. That's what moved him to changing the uh, land tenure. And the Mahele was the result. Now that is, you know, extremely controversial today. And I talked about hindsight. So, you know, you can ask yourself, well, didn't the king see the problem ahead? And I think he was far more concerned with the problem at hand and losing land piece by piece. And uh, so mm -hmm. it's a very controversial topic. Oh yeah, I mean, it definitely is. and. I would just, for the sake of people who are interested, because I know it is a very obviously, uh, and, it's, and it's probably an, an, an extremely important uh, uh, question because it arguably have le has left a very important legacy, maybe more important than some other decisions of Kawakiori's time, because obviously today we have, we have people who have lost their land or people who have land titles based on that period and, and land, the, the land is Disputes often involve those titles created during during our uh, uh, yes. time. So, but I would just uh, suggest um, for those of you who are interested in that to read that to to read maybe um, uh, three uh, more 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 recent authors who I think have have written a lot about that. Um, one is um, Tamana Beamer, uh, uh, a geographer and kind of historical geographer that we that I already mentioned. Um, uh, not not necessarily only his book, but also like various articles that he has published on on that. Um, also, uh, Donovan Preza, who is a, also a geographer, uh, um, who unfortunately hasn't published his, his his master's thesis yet, but it is actually online. So if you Google Donovan Preza Mahele, um, then you will find that it's a pretty short, like two hundred fifty page master's thesis, but really well researched and, and argued. And then there's also another PhD uh, thesis that has not been published yet by um, Umi Perkins uh, about native tenant rights, which is another thing, which is, I guess, something that gets often underestimated 
is that Karikyu Uli did, you know, as whatever we think about, whatever we think about land, whether land should be sold or privately titled or any of this, but the, the fact that that ten, tenant rights, which is something that is not in Western Anglo-Saxon uh, land law, but it directly derives from, from Hawaiian traditional uh, systems of land tenure, the fact that that was actually written into those titles, but later ignored by American courts now, um, uh, that is kind of, you know, another very interesting aspect of, I think, how Kawike Uli cared for his people and tried to kind of mitigate these things. Uh, that's, that's my, so, so there's Umi Perkins' uh, dissertation about native tenant rights that is kind of covers that as well. And there's also um, Bahine Aipohaku, uh, what's her last name, Tong, I think, who has also published something very, really interesting, I think, together with Kamana Beamer in the Hulili Journal, a very interesting um, analysis of how the Mahele and ten native tenants' rights and how this kind of worked on the ground, like they, they went through like land, land records throughout the kingdom. And so, I mean, it, again, this kind of gives a different picture from what normally is like from the some of the older historiography that just said, oh, the missionaries wanted to steal the land. They told they, they told Kawikiri to make a land reform, and then it took all the land, which is kind of the the kind of you know simplified uh, and unqualified <laughs> dismissal of the Mayala that, that that a lot of us have heard. But anyway, so it is, it's, it's a very complex topic, but I just pointed out there is, there's a lot of other literature uh, uh, covering that. And I think um, I, I kind of agree that probably for your book that focuses just on like the, the kingdom governance and international relations, we, we have to just, you know, obviously it's understandable that you don't open that whole other can of worms that goes, you know, that right. you merits a lot of other, several other right. books probably. Right. Just why did he, you know, it was my idea on why he did it. And uh, um, we all know the unintended consequences. Sure. Um, I have like another, since we, I don't think we get any more questions in the chat. Uh, I'm not seeing any, but um, let me just ask another question, which I think is really important. And it's a question in a way that, that, can be asked to both of us, I, I guess, should have been or should have been, should be asked by a, maybe a Kanaka person to both of us. And because nobody's doing it right now, I'm just, you know, allowing myself to do it. Like, what about the positionality? What about both of us? I guess the fact that we are both um, Haole, not, not, not indigenous or not OEV or, or Hawaiian scholars. And like, how do we see um, our positionality and I guess our kuleana and what we're doing as, as non-Hawaiians to do this kind of research? You wanna say something well, about that? Well, I was born and raised in Hawaii and I realized I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, Hawaiian, but I certainly have a, a great affinity to, uh, to my home and always had a very, uh, large interest in, in Hawaiian history. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I mean, there's nothing else written. No, very little uh, attention has been paid to uh, Kamehameha III. He was really a very remarkable man and he deserved, he deserves to have, uh, he deserves to be celebrated. And so I saw an opportunity and I stepped in and filled it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I think, um, uh, I guess I would, since I asked that question and it's a question uh, and it, it concerns me as well, I would just, I guess, um, kind of say something similar. Like for me, it's a little bit, I mean, I guess I'm one step, one step more remote because I'm not from Hawaii. Uh, I, so I don't have, I, I, I'm not only not from the land, but also not born on the land. Um, but, um, you know, I have uh, had, you know, a, a kind of a deep affinity to, um, to the region, not just to Hawaii, but to, uh, to Oceania. I guess um, Epili Haofa has written some really nice, uh, some really nice thoughts about that, about what, what makes an, 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 what makes an Oceanian, not to be confused with an indigenous person from Oceania, which of course I'm not, but what makes an Oceanian in the sense of somebody who is, who, who has, who is in there? Who lives in the region and cares deeply about it, and cares deeply about the land, and is has connections, is connected to the people, has kind of is is part of of, of networks of research. Uh, somebody who is not extractive in a sense of just come like a parachuting, so-called parachuting scholar who comes into 
a island uh, produces some research in order to promote himself somewhere in England or wherever, and then kind of doesn't care about the community anymore. So, I mean, I guess that is something, you know, seriously to, to, to criticize, but um, I, you know, I, like I said, I've been, been living in the region for like, you know, uh, 20 years now uh, uh, in, in the Pacific, and I, I mean, I deeply care about it and, 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 you know, want to just, you know, I guess, produce scholarship that is useful to, you know, to just advance, uh, uh, you know, the look looking at the, at the history and also, you know, therefore help communities to move forward after a lot of, you know, abusive colonial research that has been done uh, and that was not helpful in the past or like distortions or like misinterpretations like in Hawaiian history, like like the, the fact that Koi Kiwuli has been either ignored or misinterpreted by people like Kaik and right. And, and whatever, and that there is a certain that those who have the opportunity to do this kind of research have a kuleana to to expose that and to 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 produce uh, you know uh, and, and, and contribute to like a, uh, and also foster of course foster uh, 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 other scholars uh, uh, hopefully more more indigenous scholars as well in the future to 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 pick up and and do more of that of of that research. Um, well, there's just an enormous amount of uh, uh, further scholarship that could be performed on uh, on Kamehameha the Third's reign. I mean, it's just oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, the uh, historical analyses are just sitting there in the archives, waiting to be looked at, and uh, there's just an enormous amount of uh, work left to be done so that we can fully understand that reign. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and I mean, I. I think one of the one of the things is that we have like you know because we have this long history of Hawaii's um, you know distortion of its history through the American invasion and occupation and whatever we 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 talk about it. Um, but uh, so there is and, and of course the language lost too. The, the fact that the language was banned and like five generations of of, of of Hawaiians did not have the access to their own history to their own historical records or only very, only small parts of it because of, of of the language not being revived yet. Um, so because of all these reasons, we are now kind of in a way starting from scratch again. And I think we can only uh, you know like the, the 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 contributions that 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 we are doing is um you know it's it's just like you know it's a, it's a small part and if 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 you look at countries that have not been occupied or colonized that had like a more i guess a more healthy history of their historiography just think about like how many biographies are there of a person like Charles de Gaulle of France or of you know Emperor Showa of Japan or like any of these historic figures of course there are hundreds of them and each of them looks at a certain angle some of them are done by scholars from that country and from that culture most of them actually, but some are also done from scholars from another, from whatever, from somebody who is, who is from Africa or from South America, or from like a really different culture. And who maybe because right. of that also offers angles that maybe a native person from that same culture doesn't have. So that's what I'm, you know, that's what I, so I, I see, I see the future like 100 years from now, hopefully to have like 30 biographies of Kauri Keoli from a different angle. And so, Absolutely. you know, anyway, that's my, um, so let me just uh, go through, um, let me just go through two more because we're kind of at the end of here. So there's one question about the owners of allodial titles. Um, I think that is an excellent question, but I think since we are both not uh, having researched land titles at the, well, I have done some of the research, but not also not really? enough. And so I would, again, hopefully you can address these questions, the person can address these questions to people like Kamana Beamer, to Donovan Preza, to Umi Perkins, or to Keanu Sai, who I think all, all four of them have done a lot really detailed analysis of the land titles and the allodial and also also like the ramifications to today which of course are very important but i just don't want to say anything that might be wrong or confusing and whatever and plus we are running out of time so i would just really really uh, 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 ask that person to uh, to to redirect the question now the uh, another one is here uh, let me see another question um the question yeah by roger here are you that's i think that's a good final questions uh to 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 end this uh, are you going to research the period further what's next for you yes yes i am there there are some aspects of uh of the of uh events in his reign that that i've been looking into that i i hope to uh, turn into uh um a serious work so let me just leave it at that i'm pursuing two different uh two different topics at the moment 
Okay, well, um, thank you so much again, Susan, for uh, this wonderful uh, one hour session. Um, I think we did cover a lot of ground, um, probably as much as we can in, in one hour and uh, with such an intriguing topic and such a such a central person in Hawaiian history that has been so underappreciated. Um, so I thank you again for that. And I guess before we close the entire session, I will just turn it over to Roger. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. I enjoyed it very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Tom. A really, really interesting discussion on, on a topic that we don't know anything like enough about. Uh, you, you really shed a lot of light, fresh light on it. And I look forward to seeing what else you're going to produce on it. Um, I have one uh, uh, off topic, which is we do hope to be in person next year, on next October. It takes a lot of funding. Uh, we have a fundraiser on January the 26th. Uh, so attendees, please put that in your calendar and I'll be reminding you endlessly for the rest of this month and beyond. Again, thank you very much, Lawrence, for the excellent moderating. Thank you again, Susan, for uh, really fascinating insight. Aloha.